fine group of people out here. Everybody's looking pretty good. Good to see you all here. Good to see the Muster family with us. Seems like they got bigger since the last time they were here. <laughs> Did you know you had that many children, Ruth? Uh, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> So good to see you all in church. Let's have an opening word of prayer, and then we'll go into our singing. Dear God, thank you so much we can be in your house again this morning. Bless every part of this service. You be with us. Help us to feel your presence in your name. Amen. You may see it and grab a hymnal. Take your hymnal and turn to number five. Number five. I think it is about the most people I've seen this far forward for a long time, so it's good to see that. Really good.
Could you pray for my friends who are all here and the residents? 
Say that again, you're what? The residents there drive off to the Oh. Say how good it is to see Al in the church. How long has it been, Al? About four months? Yeah. Really good to see him. Let's really pray for Tim and Glenda. And keep Peggy in your prayers. And then I got word from several this week that... I guess he's considered a boy. That was burnt severely there last week or the week before. The week before. With that explosion, he passed away this week. So let's really care for that family. All right. All hearts are clear. Just bow your heads and join with me in prayer, please. Your Father, we thank you again. For the privilege and the, just the wonderful feeling to be back in church again. We praise your name for keeping us strong and helping us through. And would you just bless us in a special way this morning with your presence and your spirit. Would you just be with every part of this service. Would your name be glorified. We thank you for all you do for us. And we praise you for the wonderful gift of salvation and, and the, the freedom we can have in you. We think of those that are struggling physically and, and otherwise. Uh, many, many people here have needs on their hearts that are just too heavy to, to mention. Would you be with those? Thank you so much that Al can be here this morning. Would you continue to help him? Give him strength and encourage Darlene. Be with Tim and Glenda right now at home. Would you give them a special touch? Would you would you work with, with Tim, Lord? Would you give him healing and mature will? Would you encourage them both? Be with Peggy. Would you give her a special touch today and encourage her? Be with the Hellmans and the, and the struggles they're facing there. We just encourage them. Think of Kitty as she's still recovering and give her a special physical touch. And think of the family of this young man that passed away. It's such a heartache and such an unexpected tragedy. Would you just reach down and give them a special touch? And be with Barb ends as she's really struggling physically. Help those that are involved. Give them encouragement and strength. And most of all, would you be near and give healing if it's at your will? And think of all those that are in nursing homes and those that are working there, ones that are working in the hospitals that are still dealing with this mess. Would you give them a special touch and give them safety and protection? Help us as a church to use our time here with the challenges we're facing to better your kingdom, to reach out, and to glorify you. Encourage each one of us spiritually and help us to stay close to you. In your name, amen. Starting um, next Sunday morning, to make it a little bit easier to count the offering and um, get it posted on the board, if you would place your offering in the plate coming in. Uh, I think we can do that safely now. Just put it in the plate before you come to sit down. For this today, you can put it in going out. That's fine. Um, Sunday School Board meeting this Tuesday at 6.30. And those of you that don't know, Wednesday evenings are on regular schedule. I think everybody knows that. Next Sunday night, we're going to start our focus groups in the gym again. So it's been a while since we've done that. So I encourage you to come out. And if you have something you want to talk about, bring that too because I haven't decided yet. Um, the next Sunday night at 7, um, bring a snack to share. And if you still have yet to start your focus group that you're in charge of, go ahead and do that when you're ready. And should be a Sunday school announcement coming shortly after our board meeting. We're going to uh, be announcing when we'll start Sunday school. But here in the next couple of weeks, I believe we'll be starting Sunday school. Trustee meeting. Um, we have Ben and Dean. Um, we're going to move the trustee meeting to July 2nd, if that works for you. That's a Thursday night. Does that work? Okay. So, Steve, we have Bobby and Dean Hess and Brian Dittell. Dean Hess is here. Is he? 
Oh, Dean, you can see, does that work for you, July 2nd? Yeah. Okay. Bobby and, and, and Brian there. Okay, thank you. Brian's not here, is he? No. He's so small. <laughs> he just didn't hear it. <laughs> Alright, I think that's all my announcements, unless I'm missing something. <laughs> Grab your handles, we'll sing another song. Take your handle and turn to number 607. Number 607. someone to think 
what you're know what you're thinking right now. Like we're all in church, so I'm hoping it's all good thoughts, but we don't want people knowing what we're thinking. Sometimes it can be embarrassing, sometimes incriminating. I'm glad God's the only one can do that. So we're what are we thinking about? That's my I'm coming to a, a conclusion here. So last week, this well-known verse, Philippians 4 8, came to me. And I know all of you know it. Whatever things are pure, lovely, and good report, and all that. As I thought about this verse and the fact that our minds are a breeding ground for a lot of problems, I felt like the Lord impressed me to use this passage for today's message. We are living in a period right now the likes of which have never, ever been seen before in history. So right away you'll say, well, we had a pandemic, well, none of you remember it, but a pandemic back in 1918, the Spanish flu. Yeah, we, we had that. And we've had riots before, yeah, we've had those. But the big difference, we have technology at our fingertips instantly. That's what makes a difference. So as soon as a news article, or as soon as a rumor, or as soon as a conspiracy gets started, within seconds it can be all over the world. And that's not exaggerating, that, that happens. So because of this pandemic, we've been given, at least in the last little while, <clears throat> like it or not, a lot of extra time. Some of us. Jason, have you had a lot of extra time on your hands? <laughs> What are we doing with that extra time, if you have some? Have we and are we using it constructively? See, I know for myself, I have to keep busy with something or my mind goes to places that aren't helpful. <clears throat> so during something scary, if you thought the pandemic was scary, um, if I didn't keep busy, I would, I'd probably get to worrying too much. And it just, I knew I needed to keep busy. So it was along these lines that the sermon came to me for today, and I feel like without a doubt, there are many, many people, because of just having extra time on their hands, maybe to study or research or just too much time to think, that have gotten themselves into a very anxious or very paranoid, even angry, fearful state, because they weren't guarding their thoughts like they should have been. Can you relate to any of that? Is that maybe it rings true for you. I, I don't know. I know for myself, like I said, if I, I, if I didn't keep active, I would get myself into a sorry, sorry state because of thinking too much over certain things. So let's look to God's word here and see if we can connect these two. Philippians chapter 4, I want to read verses 1 through 9. As I've been sharing with you, I've been trying to take the context of a passage. And verses 1 through 9 is a paragraph in, in my, my Power Bible program. And I... I Learned a lot by taking this whole passage and ju just using verse 8, but rather using the whole passage there. And what can we learn from it? Starting with verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Just wanted to check something in my notes before I move on to make sure I'm on the right track. Paul was a really... 
really passionate writer. The more I study Paul's writings, the more I'm just amazed at his intelligence and his love for the people that he was witnessing to. And this passion really comes out in, the, in this passage from Philippians. Is there something in this passage that would apply to this whole mess we're in? I put it into one word, and I call it poropandemorites. You follow that? So coronavirus, pandemic, and riots. Put that all together. That's what we're in right now. And I'm pretty sure that word will catch on soon because since we're live, it's just going to go all over the world, and I'm going to get royalties for that word and become real famous. But is there something in this passage here that Paul was telling his friends many years ago that just might be able to be applied here? And I want to tell you, I was amazed at how much this passage applies to us right now. So let's first talk about being strong in the faith. If one is all familiar, at all familiar with Paul's writings, they'll know that he often encourages his followers, his, his disciples, or, or people he was witnessing to, to stand strong in their faith. To keep the faith. He gives them very practical advice. I love his, his writings. And this chapter in Philippians is no exception. I want to look down through the first five, verse, five verses here and see what kind of encouragement Paul gives to the uh, Philippian church to stand strong in their faith. First, you can really see his love and passion for these people when he says, Beloved, long for my joy, my crown. Now, those words don't really... It's a little weird today to say that. I wouldn't call you my joy and crown. I just, I can't imagine wearing steeple on my head as a crown. That would be a little weird. But if we could put it in today's vocabulary, Paul might say something like this. You guys mean the world to me. Your friendship and fellowship is really special. I'm thrilled to see you walking with the Lord. I'm proud of you. I think that's what he means by saying my crown. I'm proud of you guys. And I want to make something clear to you as a church. And now I'm not pretending to be the Apostle Paul by saying this. But you guys mean a lot to me. I am really proud to be a part of Montgomery. It's, it's just a blessing. And you guys have been a real blessing to me. In verse 2, Paul is speaking to Yodius and Syntyche that they need to work together. Not sure exactly why these women had these names. I'm not sure if their mom sneezed right before they named them or what happened, but he used to say that's their names. Um, but there's some disagreement among commentators that say who these people were, but the most common belief is these were two deaconesses that just had some things to work out. And from what I understand, these deaconesses back in those days were ministering to the women of the church. This is really good admonition. If we as Christians are ever to stay strong in our faith, we need to learn to get along with each other. If we're not handling differences of opinions correctly, then we're going to get weak spiritually because it's it's a it's a contention. And Paul knew this really well, so he gave this simple, practical advice on how to make that happen. And I just want to encourage each of you, and I'm not pointing any fingers at all, but if you have issues with someone, if you can, get it figured out. Go and work it out. Make for peaceful fellowship because... We're told as much as lies within us to live peacefully with all people. And sometimes it's not possible. But if we can make it happen, let's try it. Then Paul says in verse 3, to work together with those that are also Christians to accomplish the mission we're to accomplish as disciples of Jesus. It's pretty hard to work together and minister together if we don't get along. And I've said many times through this whole pandemic, our mission couldn't be more clear. We're to spread peace, not panic. Or to tell others where that peace comes from. Are we working together to make that happen? Then verse 4 shows us that we're to be praising God for what he's done through to us through Jesus. Or for us through Jesus. If we don't show gratitude and praise to Jesus for what he's done, do you think we'll stay strong in our faith? Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. And you could probably think of a bunch of other songs of praise. Paul tells the church at Philippi to be careful about their testimonies. Be gentle in your spirits. Show moderation. And I see this verse, verse 5, 
as a general reminder that if we want to influence others to Christ, then we need to have the proper testimony. We need to also remember that when no one else is watching, God is watching. Personally, I feel like that's why the phrase, the Lord is at hand, is in verse 5, because he's always, he's always there. So let's move into the main theme of what I want to speak about, and that's guard your thoughts. If we want to stay strong as Christians, then we need to really be careful what we're thinking about. This section, verse, this next few verses, I'm sure just about everyone here should be very well known. But it so fits our current climate so well. And it starts with prayer. Paul starts in verse 6 with some very helpful words about worry. Don't focus so much on the worry, but rather take those worries to God. Easier said than done, but that's very good admonition. That's where we need to start when we think our minds might be getting away from us, run away with us. There would be so much less chaos and panic and conspiracies if prayer was practiced first. Do you agree with me? It's not natural for us to immediately start praying when something bothers us because we've been conditioned to handle our problems ourselves. We don't go to God first. We figure it out. And, oh, let's just pray about that. Yeah. Paul tells us in verse 7 that if we take these things to God first, then he can provide the peace that the world can't give. But the main point I want you to notice in verse, um, in verse 7, he will guard your hearts and minds. There are so many times I pray and I don't possess within myself any ability to accomplish what I'm praying about. I Sometimes I don't really want to forgive the person I'm praying for, even though I know it's the right thing to do. Sometimes I don't really feel like loving another person, even though I know God wants me to. And even though I know I'm to guard my heart and mind, I know it's really not going to be possible in my own strength. So I know that with any other issue, it's only through God that it's going to get accomplished. So therefore, by taking our problems to God and talking about, you know, a little bit ago we said, when prayer and supplication, we take these problems to God. We don't really have to stress and worry wondering if we can guard our minds because we know that it's him that's helping us do that. This really reduces the burden of self-sufficiency in my opinion. I don't have to do it alone. So also notice in the last part of verse 7 the phrase through Jesus Christ. Anything, and that is anything we do as Christians is only through his power. And the power that was given us through his death. Incredible, incredible gift. So it starts with prayer, but then what is your mind feeding on? Just like with food, we become what we eat. So is what, so it is with our minds. We become what we think about. What's your thoughts? They become words. What's your words? They become actions. What's your actions? They become actions. Habits. What's your habits? They become character. What's your character? It becomes your destiny. If you don't think a thought controls your destiny, they can. So what are you feeding your mind on? I think it's very evident today. If we look around, we look on Facebook, we look at the news. You just have to scroll a few pages on Facebook to see what's going on, what people are feeding their minds on. There is so much anger and outrage. There's debates and arguments from anything from politics to racial tensions. It's, it's, it's rampant. So how does this happen? It comes from feeding our minds on too much negativity. And there is so much negativity in the media today. It's ridiculous. And if we feed on this negativity, it will come out of us eventually. And this is happening in some Christians that I've seen, and it really concerns me. If there was ever a verse that shows very clearly what to do and think about during times like these, verse 8 really sums it up. And I want to take verse 8 and break it down piece by piece and just see how it applies. And it's crazy how much it applies. So finally, brethren, whatever things are true. What is truth? Have you ever heard that phrase recently? Just about every teenager today seems to use it. What is truth? Because they're not being taught the truth. Um, 
We live in a world that has so skewed the truth that people, especially the younger generation, do not know what the truth is. So what do we know right now to be truth? If we scroll Facebook, do we find truth? Well, if it's on Facebook, it has to be true, right? I mean, after all, it's on the internet. Do we look to news outlets for the truth? Yeah. They love sensationalizing everything so much. If that's their goal, then they're stretching the truth at best. We see that truth in the media just doesn't work. So the truth they share, it creates panic and fear. I mean, do they make as big of a deal about how many recoveries we've had? Or do they make a bigger deal about the people that have come down with it? It's always sensationalized. Do we look to the government for truth? In my opinion, our government is so mixed up, they don't even know what the truth is. Now, understand, I do believe there are some genuine, good, godly people in the government, few and far between, they're there. But in general, looking to politicians, we won't find the truth. Where do we find the truth? In the pages of God's Word. Without question, beyond a shadow of a doubt. We find it through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Instead of feeding on the lies that were being handed out like Halloween candy, let's instead feed on what we know to be truth. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, true and accurate. And that comes from God on high. So the next phrase, whatever things are noble. What's noble mean? King James uses honest. And if we were to use our vocabulary, we might use honorable or trustworthy. Just curious, do, you, do any of you feel like the information given to you by all the news outlets and everything, do you feel like that's trustworthy and honorable? Man, does that fit our time. Don't tell me the Bible isn't timeless. We're living in a time where any source of news, advertisement, or really any media at all isn't popular until it's sensationalized. We talked about knowing the truth there a second ago, and it's almost like if something is true, then that's not worth sharing. It needs to be exaggerated or lied about for it to become popular. And that's one reason I'm very careful about where I get my information, because I am just about doubting everything I read on the internet anymore, because I don't know it to be true. There used to be a time when picking up the newspaper and reading an article would be what it says. Not anymore. So before I go and spread something, I want to make sure it comes from a trustworthy source. Which is why I've kind of just stopped talking about on social media anything regarding this whole thing and just either share something totally stupid like a joke or something directly from God's word or that kind of truth. Can we as Christians determine that we will be honorable and trustworthy with what we share? Can we determine personally that we can be trusted? Whatever things are just. And I think, if I look back in my New King James, no, that's the right one. Whatever things are just. What does just mean? In the original Greek, it's something that means equitable in character or act. So I dug into several com commentaries and I was like, what does this actually mean and how does this relate to us? And the best way I can describe this is the word fair. Then this really caused me, man, this really fits. Is there anything going on right now about fairness, about equal rights? We're living in a time when seems like equal rights are being fought over like crazy. And I was amazed. Wow, God's word really does apply to us today. There's so much craziness going on because of people that want to be treated equally or fairly. Do you think if everyone practiced what Matthew 7, 12 says, we might see a difference? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you? In this fight for equality or fairness or whatever you want to call it, did we ever stop to consider what might have happened if God treated each one of us fairly or like we deserve to be treated? What would happen if this world would treat others the way they would want to be treated? Do you think there'd be less chaos? 
And I realize that we will never repay Jesus for what he's done for us. But if we looked at our life as a chance to repay Jesus for what he's done for us, how might that affect how we go about life? We would act differently. Are we thinking about fairness or justice in this kind of way? And then whatever things are lovely. It's like, that has to mean something different today. So the best way to put that into our words would be agreeable or even pleasant to others. Are we thinking about ways to have a good attitude? And let me explain this a little bit more personally. And I'm sure none of you have had this ever happen to you, so I'm all alone on this, so you can just hear my confession. I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. Uh, but if there's someone I'm in the league with, or someone that has go farther even hurt me very badly, I tend to have conversations with them in my head. No, okay, I can tell no one's ever done that. Um, and those conversations sometimes aren't very lovely. I'm telling you, some of them conversations I've had, they were home dinners. I said some pretty good stuff. I was like, man, I said something good there. So recently I had a situation where that was happening to me. And I caught myself and realized, in this particular situation, I haven't had these conversations in a while. And then suddenly the Lord brought me up short. I was like, Lord, I don't want to keep doing this. This isn't helping me. This is not healthy. I knew it wasn't helping my disposition. My thoughts weren't lovely, that's for sure. So let's talk about this current situation we're in. If we're constantly thinking how stupid our government officials are, and I'm not up here to debate that, how ridiculous people are in their opinions and dumb ideas, whatever you might think about others, do you think that might come out in our attitudes then, if we're thinking about that all the time? I'm thinking, wow, if we'd only think about lovely things. And then... I noticed I had left one out when I was, was studying this. Whatever things are of good report. Is there anything today that isn't being reported well? Is there anything today that you read that you can call good? Now I will say, um, I don't know how many of you Watch America's Got Talent. Um, I will skim through it and watch the actual act and not all the in-between stuff because it takes too, way too long. But I was curious to see what the beginning looked like because when they first announced the opening of the show because um, I wasn't sure when they filmed it. And it was really cool. They were showing people helping others. How America has come together and helped others. And you know what? I'd like to see that on the news a little bit more. Let's show that. Let's show people. One lady said she'd made a thousand masks and was donating them. Let's show that a little bit more. Let's, let's think about things that are good report. And then if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy. So if I was to put myself in Paul's shoes, I think at this point Paul's writing and writing and writing and like, wow, this list is going to keep going and going and going. I've got to get this stopped. So let's just wrap it all up and say, if there's anything praiseworthy, if anything virtuous. And to put it in our terminology, it would be look for the good in the situations. Find something good to think about. Ouch, because I'm just, that's not normal for me. I think about times when I, I should pray for someone, and I know I should, but I don't really know if I want to because I might find something good about them, and I don't know if I want to do that. Do you know what I mean? We need to be looking for the good. That's not naturally our tendency. One thing that annoys me with my wife, we have this conversation and say she'll try to find something good. It's like, quit trying to find the good. I'm upset right now. <laughs> so what would happen? Think about this. What would happen if we only think about those things that are true, trustworthy, fair, pleasant, good report, or just basically good? What if we filled our mind with these things? Would we as a society be so quick to run off the rails, so to speak, with outbursts and craziness? What if we as Christians led the charge in this? So that leads me to what I want to finish with, and that is follow my example. 
There's one thing among many that just astounds me with Apostle Paul in his life and testimony. And at first it might seem a little vain and pompous, but when I really thought about it, it places Paul in a very scary, tenuous, I don't know what you want to call it, just, just a very awkward situation. Not even awkward. But let me explain using verse 9. It certainly would keep him accountable. Verse 9 says, The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying here, I know I'm doing right. Follow my example. Wow. At first, it's like that's kind of proud and pompous, isn't it? I know what I'm doing is right, so you can do just like me and you'll be great. No, I don't think that's what Paul means at all. Paul said it, and he meant it. Then he'd better be absolutely certain that he's staying close to God so he can be that testimony he needs to be. By saying that, he's setting himself up to be an example for people. And wow, what a place to put yourself in. And you'd better stay close to God if you're going to do that. Do you think that applies to us right here and right now? We need to ask ourselves, am I leaving a proper testimony and example that are leading others to Jesus Christ? Can I say, what I'm doing, if you do that, you'll get to know Christ too. I've said this many times over the past several months, but we have a prime opportunity right now more than ever to let our light shine for Jesus Christ and to show people that he can bring peace that just isn't normal right now. Are we doing our job? Can we say, follow my example and I'll lead you to Christ? That's an assignment. And I personally want to be the best example I need to be so that others can see through me Christ. But yet I know I fail miserably at times. And then we need to go back to the beginning of this passage and pray. And cry out to God to take that burden and help us to do what we need to do. Help us to be the example for others to follow. So think about that. I'll ask you to stand with me this morning. Lord Jesus, would you help us, each one of us, through your grace and strength, to guard our minds and our thoughts, so that they will be thoughts that please you, that when they come out, people can see our testimony and see that we're dwelling on things that please you. Would you help each one of us to have that testimony that leads others to you that they can see through us that we know something about peace and love that Jesus Christ can bring? Would you bless everyone here? Would you encourage them in the challenges they're facing this week? And would you help them to be able to focus their minds on you and dwell on you? We thank you for all those that came out to give safety going home. and Give everyone a good week. In your name we pray. Okay, again, if you just leave from the back and drop your offering in if you have, and, and uh, meet outside to chat, please.